in the midst of life storms that when it feels like everything is shaken, then who are you and whose are you? When you are so worried about being liked, sometimes it can change your decisions where then sometimes you don't always stand for your convictions because you're swayed by your emotions. Too many times, right? We want certainty in life and it's like, well, there is no certainty. For a guy like you, oh, I won the Heisman, I got the championship, we're about to roll and then it's switched immediately. From there, like, what do you do? What's up, Wealth Builders? Today, I'm in a different set. I've got the blue brick behind me because we are in, I think they call this the swamp. Because um, I was watching, I think it was on Netflix, the the story of the Swamp Kings. I got none other than Tim Tebow. What's up, man? How you doing? Good, Thanks man. for having me. Yeah, dude. I like to do. It's looking good. Thank you. Yes. I was, we were saying, because you just uh, had Brandon Turner. You're yes. saying everyone's got their thing. Brandon's got a beard. I got hair. And then you're just super jacked. Yeah. It's just, it's fake. Yeah. 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 Dude, how how was it being like, uh, I guess, a QB that big? Because that wasn't like a thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it would help in getting hit a lot, I can tell you that. Yeah. Um, uh, and every now and then try to do some hitting as well. Yeah. But it, honestly, just lifting and trying to get better was something that as a young boy, I got to see my brothers three and six years older and, and learning. I was like, man, that's something that I want to do if I can actually, it can help me improve. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I just, and then I remember reading a book about Herschel Walker and how he'd do 400 pushups and sit-ups every day. And so all those little things were just inspiring to me to yeah. want to like start getting just get after bigger. it. Yeah. I love it. I um was talking to you know, quite a few people before this. And, um, another guy who's a big believer, um, NFL quarterback, Derek Carr, him and I, uh, live very close to each other. Okay. So we're members at the same golf course and we become good friends and, you know, I've interviewed him too, but I asked him the same thing. I was like, dude, why are you so jacked? Like you're a quarterback. You know, if you ever watch Derek, his arms are like popping out of his sleeves. Yeah. But, uh, what was his answer? <laughs> He's just like, dude, these guys are big, man. Oh, yeah. They want to hurt you. And, yeah. And when you get hit, you just, the stronger you are, the less chance a lot of things don't break. <laughs> yep. Yep. You got more protection. <laughs> That's right. So before this, I was looking up some different things about you. And, uh, you know, I knew that you were born in the Philippines, yes. which my dad was born in the Philippines. So I'm Let's half go. Filipino. And Come on. Um, I actually I, haven't been yet. Do you speak any Tagalog? None. Okay. Not a lick. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm going to the Philippines for the first time in my life um, in a couple of months. Come on. So I'm you, excited. You have a the plan? No plans. I have nothing. Okay. I don't know what I'm going to do. All right. Well, well, we'll have to talk after this. Yeah. So I'll give you some stuff you need to go see and do. Yeah. Yes. I'm going for like five days. So it's whatever you, you need suggest. to make it longer, but yes. Okay. So I'm going to do it's that. It's an amazing place. And I'll say this, I've been fortunate to go to a lot of countries around the world. I, I really believe that it is some of the nice, if not the nicest people in the world. Yeah. They have a massively big heart. Um, they will invite you in for dinner. They will care about you. They will care for you. Even if they have very little, they will want to share it with you. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing place. Yeah. No, I, my dad has 12 brothers and sisters, so they all came from the Philippines to Vegas and, um, yeah, just like Filipinos in general are like the, I would say the happiest people. Some of the happiest, no like, doubt. They don't need money. They don't, they're just happy go lucky yes. no matter what's happening. Yes. That's probably why they make good nurses and everything else too. And you know what? You can go all around the world and you will see in hospitality um, and uh, as nurses, yeah. Filipinos all around the oh, world. Oh yeah. They're, they all work at casinos and in Vegas and <laughs> hospitality. So the, the thing that I didn't know though was uh, I was reading, I was like, wait a minute, Tebow was going to play for the Philippines in the World Baseball I Classic. Was, yes. Did that ever happen? It did not because of COVID. Yeah. And I was so disappointed because I was so excited when I got invited to play for Team Philippines. And I was so excited when I was going to have the chance to just represent a country that I, I love so much, that's so near and dear to my heart, mm -hmm. um, a country that I was born in, um, that I spent the first five years of my life. And it's a country that has... Um, uh, Many times God has used um, people and places there to really impact my life too mm -hmm. in special ways. And uh, we're fortunate to serve in a lot of different areas there in the Philippines. And it's an incredible place. Yeah. No, I love that. 
I um I got to play for their national team in the World Baseball Classic in 2012. Come on. Yeah. So that was the first year. Um I, I, like they started the World Baseball Classic maybe a couple of years prior. Yeah, I think so. Um how'd so, y'all do? So, dude, I'll tell you a story. This was the Philippines' first year. So I was in the Oakland A system at the time. And they were like, hey, if you have, you know, one descendant away, you can qualify. I was like, oh, my dad was born in Manila. Cool. So they're like, oh, you're in. I was like, all right. Uh, like, there's no tryout. There's nothing. All right, whatever. <laughs> so they, you know, we're getting ready. And they're like, yeah, just fly to Taiwan. That's where the qualifier is. We'll, we'll, we'll practice there. So I fly to Taiwan and I'm like, I don't know what to expect. Right. And um, sure enough, I get there and dude, this team is like half, you know, Americans that maybe they were in college. There was a couple of pro guys and then the, the half were Filipinos. And I mean, let me tell you, Filipinos are not the greatest athletes. We're very small people. And uh, I was like, oh boy, we're going to have, we're going to have some uh, work to do here. But uh, we ended up going, I want to say one in three. We, we beat Thailand. We okay. faced New Zealand. Uh, or one and two, maybe. And then we lost to Chinese Taipei who ended up winning it. But um, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing experience. I actually got That's to, so um, awesome. yeah, I was, it was, it was crazy, man. I did well. So I was happy and yeah, you know, just overall the experience was crazy. Nice. Yeah. So when I saw that, I was like, dude, that's so random. Like what a small I, we world. We were close to then having a chance to maybe play on the same team. I, we're, we're like brothers, I guess. That's right. <laughs> so Let's talk about like sports, you know, because obviously that's, uh, you know, if I look at your life, obviously people know you for sports or faith and, you know, just how you've intertwined both. And I was watching um, the documentary, the Netflix documentary and really good. And I just remember like seeing how hard you guys were working and and what it took to like win championships and everything. And one thing that stuck out to me, I just remember because we're close to the same age. I was like. I wonder what it's like being in the spotlight at that young of an age, but also being that bold in your faith, like being in the spotlight on its own is already hard enough, but to be so countercultural along with it, how was it? WealthCon's coming back to Vegas, January 8th to the 11th. Now, if you've been to our events, you know how epic they are. We have the best time, not only with just great content, great speakers, but we have a lot of fun with the after parties and the masterminds and everything else. And number one, it's the, probably the best networking opportunity in the entire game. We have over a thousand investors and entrepreneurs at each one, and this will be no different. In fact, this is gonna be my favorite WealthCon ever. We've got some amazing speakers coming, people like Tim Tebow, Thatch Nguyen, Gabrielle Lyon, the list goes on. It is going to be an epic event, and I wanna see you there. So if you're interested in attending, get your tickets now because they will not last. Go to wealthcon.org and get them today. I just have never really considered myself someone that was very bold. Um, I would like to be, um, but I I just see people like my dad and other amazing people that are around the world that have been truly bold. The best definition, I believe, of boldness is to put it all on the line to do what is necessary. I've never had to put it all on the line if I was ever asked. I don't, who knows if I even would be willing to do so? I hope so. But right. There would be times I would want to stand for my convictions, but there's also been so many times I shied away from it. Mm -hmm. And maybe not everybody knows that, but I do. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the hard things about um, being more in the spotlight is you really have to try to figure out what you want to stand for. And one of the hard things for me was is that I'm a people pleaser by nature, mm. that I want people to like me. I want to be friends. I hope that you like me. I hope <laughs> we're friends. I just, I yeah. naturally, that's always the way I, I just was wired. And you know, when, when you are so worried about being liked, sometimes it can change your decisions and your decision-making process where then sometimes you don't always stand for your convictions because you're swayed by your emotions mm -hmm. and you're swayed in a way that's not always right or not yeah. always what you would want. And um, I remember reading a book about Winston Churchill that at this time in his life, he was disliked by most people around the world 
because they thought he was losing the war for the Allies. And if you weren't on the Allies, then you were literally his enemy. Yeah. And he says, if you have enemies, good. It means you stood for something at least once in your life. Mm. And I was like, <laughs> how could it be good to have enemies? Like, right. That did, didn't make sense to me. Yeah. And I, I was, but I was so convicted. And see, one of the things that he understood that many times I have forgotten is that he was willing to stand for his convictions and that not everybody might understand, but one day they might see it differently. Mm -hmm. And now you look at the way that people talk about Winston Churchill and it's with honor and discipline and integrity and, um, and wisdom. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's also around that same time. I remember getting criticized on another level than ever before. Mm -hmm. I remember going home and seeing my dad. I said, dad, I'm like, man, if, if some of these people would just like meet me and talk to me, get to know me, dad, they would like me. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I, I remember my dad saying, you're right, Timmy. Most of them probably would because you're likable. Mm -hmm. But Timmy, some of them probably won't even want to talk to you mm. because they won't even want to like you. Yeah. And it was really kind of struggling with what am I really going to let speak louder in my life? The, the, wa the want and the emotions to be liked or the de desire to try to live out convictions. And, and I would say the balance between being liked and maybe being respected. Mm -hmm. And it's something I know I failed at many times um, because I can give in to that want of maybe not doing something that I should because I just want to be liked. Yeah. And um, that's something I still battle with to this day because that is so much of my nature, but I would, I would rather be someone that tries to gain respect, not just likes because respect is deeper than a like would ever be. Mm -hmm. And when we live on a, just for likes, one, we live very surface level. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not super deep. Yeah. It is really on the surface and it will come and go. You say one thing that someone likes, they're there. One thing they don't like, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Right. And look at all of our social medias. Yeah. There's a like button for a reason. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, one of the challenges that I presented to myself was what if on the social media of your life wasn't a like button, but a respect button? Mm. How many people would click? Yeah. I don't, I don't agree with them, but I respect their opinion and That's right. why they believe it. And, and, but think about also yeah. as a society, if instead of just a like or a dislike, we were willing to just have conversations and it's, you know what? My dad's my greatest hero and greatest role model. But if we sat down long enough, eventually we would disagree on something. Oh yeah. But there's such a level of respect there. But what if we had that level of respect for everyone? Mm -hmm. Because it didn't just go on a surface level conversation but it was based on something so much more yeah and um that's that's just been a conviction and something that I, I strive to try to do better and better yeah yeah i mean in the world of social media right what goes viral is usually controversial right because you're going to have all these people that are so strongly opinionated on both sides and you know i've realized that for me um as somebody who wants to be bold in the marketplace you know, there's going to be things that um, you do that are going to be criticized, right? Mm -hmm. And you see big companies criticized, all like Chick Fil A, and you know all these things that are, you know, being criticized for Christian beliefs. And it just kind of is what it is, right? I mean, like Jesus said, you got to count the cost, and like you know, there's there's going to be persecution along the way. And I think that you know, here in America, we think we're being persecuted because people don't like us. And it's like, that's just like the very like surface level yes. of, of what it really is. But what you just said is important. What you just said is perspective. You know, when, when we go back to the origin of perspective, it means to look through, right? And sometimes we can't look through that noise to actually see like, man, that's not actually a lot of, you know, persecution. It's yeah. just some people didn't like what I said. <laughs> You know, and I'm not bold because of that. You know who's bold is so many people that are putting their life on the line around the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to look through to see what real boldness is is like. Yeah. No, 100%. I agree. It's interesting you said there are times where you knew you were called to do something and you didn't do it, right? And 
somebody asked me one time, they were like, Ryan, what do you think the definition of success is? And I started to think about it and I was like, you know, I've always felt successful even when I was a minor leaguer making 1200 bucks a month, whether I was starting my first business and failing or, you know, whatever the case is, right. I've always felt successful. And I think the reason I always felt successful is because I knew that I was being obedient to whatever God was calling me to do at that time, whatever that was Mm -hmm. at that season of life. And the times I felt like I wasn't successful, it was clear that I wasn't doing what I knew I needed to do. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things where, um, a lot of people ignore like the, uh, I guess the urgings of what the spirit's calling them to do because they're scared. They, mm-hmm. they don't know how it's going to go. And yep. they end up just kind of like going with what they know or what yes. might seem certain or yes. whatever. And it just usually doesn't end the way that they were hoping. I think, um, when we think about that, the calling that God gives us. And one of the ways that I'll talk about is what has your eyes been open to and what has your heart been pricked for? And so many times we, we, <laughs> In the, in the church, we'll say, how do you know your calling? How do you know your purpose? How do you, you know the mission that God has for you? And, and a lot of times answer, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times I feel like it'll start by a pricking of your heart mm-hmm. for a need, for a person, um, for a country, for a place, for an injustice. And your eyes will be open to that. And the question is, will we answer that, step into that? And, um, I know there's been times where I've, my heart, eyes have been open, my heart's been pricked and I haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I know, um, the first time I I really felt like I was uh, called to something in my life was when I was 15 years old and I met a boy in the jungles of the Philippines who was born with his feet on backwards. And because he was born with his feet on backwards, his village viewed him as less than insignificant, as cursed, and as a throwaway. But I knew that he wasn't a throwaway to God. Mm-hmm. And I knew God was pricking my heart saying, yeah, Timmy, but what is he going to be to you? Mm. And I, I didn't know what that looked like, right? It was it that action from there. I just knew that I'm supposed to somehow speak up for or fight for or help the people that are viewed as less than as cursed because they're not to God, but what are they going to be to me? Mm -hmm. And many times along the way, I, I've had to be reminded from God because sometimes I can be hard headed and have to be (laughs) reminded of that. But it was also when I would go back to, to serving in those areas and those places and those needs, it's also when I would be most fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So yes, we might not always know where that calling leads and exactly the way we're supposed to live it out. But I also believe when we say yes to it, many times it's also the most fulfilled that we will ever be. Mm -hmm. So you might not know where this road leads exactly, but you know that when, when it's something you believe that God is, is, is pricking your heart for is, is saying, Hey, this is where I want you to step in. You might not know every bit of it or how to do it or a seven step plan or, but man, if that's where, where God's leading you, well, it's and, also where you're going to be fulfilled at. Yeah. And, and usually <laughs> it, that that's the definition of what faith is, right? Like if you had the full right. seven step plan and the outcome was already determined, that's it, right. there would be no faith required. That's right. Right. It's like, usually God is just revealing the first step. Yes. And you're like, I don't know where this is going to trust but, me with the next one. Yeah. Go to the first step. You'll, the rest will be revealed for yes. that stage. And then yep. the next stage. And I think, um, too many times, right? We want certainty in life. And it's like, well, there is no certainty, right? Like the only certainty is that you are going to die and that, you know, hopefully you know where you're going afterwards. Like that is the only certainty in life. And people don't really realize that because like in business and everything, we're trying to de-risk. We're trying to like hedge for retirement Mm -hmm. and build a nest egg and have enough cash flow to survive. And it's like, we're trying to be as comfortable as possible. Exactly. Everything in us is our, our emotions. 
compel us to try to be as comfortable as possible. And when we are trying to walk out this journey of loving Jesus and, and trying to live for him, it's saying, hey, will, will you be willing to believe that actually when you give, you actually get? Mm-hmm. That is countercultural. That wait a second, how could I actually have more when I'm giving? Yeah. That wait a second, how when I pour out, could I actually have more? Yeah. How when I give, can I get? Yeah. How, um, and, and it's it's these these areas that we actually have to choose to really live out by faith and and really believe yeah. that sometimes don't always make sense logically, but that's where um, what is compelling us in our heart. If you're a Christian entrepreneur or somebody who's interested in growing in their faith, I would love to invite you to one of our Wealthy Kingdom Bible studies that's going on nationwide. If you have no idea what it is, we just started the community earlier this year and we now have 50 Bible studies already happening. And we also have virtual group meetings. We have different mission trips and all these other retreats and things happening every single month. And I would love for you to be a part of it. So if you want to learn more about joining the community, we are actually in the process of becoming an official nonprofit. And so I would love to see you there contributing and helping us grow in the mission. So go to wealthykingdom.com. You can learn more about it today. And I can't wait to see you on one of the calls or in one of the Bible studies. Yeah, I was just um, reading Malachi 3.10, where God's like, the only time God ever said to test him, test me in this, you know, give, and I will like make everything so overflowing that you won't even know what to do with, you know, a hundredfold. And it's like, yeah, I mean, he just wants you to see what he's capable of if you just take that first initial step of trusting him. And it doesn't mean that, when you give to him that you're going to get it everything that way you want. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that we can trust him because his character is trustworthy Mm -hmm. because he really does have a plan and a purpose for our lives that he really does love us so much that he demonstrated his love for us on the cross that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us Mm -hmm. that he really did go on a rescue mission for humanity, for you and me. And that when he was on the cross, we were on his mind. Yeah. Right. That's a character that I can, trust that's a character that is trustworthy that if he was willing to go to a cross to bear my sins and yours for him if he's willing to do that it, do you think he's <laughs> wants to withhold other good it just yeah. means that sometimes it's not actually good for us to mm-hmm. have certain things yeah that there really is a plan and a purpose in that God's love and sovereignty, somehow he really is working it all together. Those who love him and are called according to his yeah. purpose. And Romans that's what we have to trust. Yeah. And it's like, he knows what's good for us. Why, why would I know what's good for me? I'm like so limited that's in right. my knowledge. Well, and, so many times I thought was good for me is God, can we win a Super Bowl? Yeah. And, like, <laughs> let, yeah. let's talk about that because like <laughs> for, for a guy like you, who it was like, man, I'm going on the path. Like everything's great. I'm going to, you know, the school right down the street. You know, I'm going to be the quarterback. Oh, I won the Heisman. I got a championship. And, you know, now I'm a first round. Like to you, everything's going according to plan. Right. And I remember watching, um, (laughs) you know, Tebow time that year with the Broncos, where it was just like, yep, if anyone doubts God now, watch like <laughs> the fourth quarter of every Broncos game and you're you're going to be a believer, right? <laughs> and, uh, you yeah. know, it ends. Yeah. Right? And ironically, Josh McDaniels, I think he was your coach, right? Mm-hmm. He just got fired too from the Raiders. Um, but, uh, you know, it ends and now you're like, well, dang, now what? Right? Because they signed this guy, Peyton Manning, who's pretty good. Yeah, he's pretty good. Yeah, like he has a, he's had a decent career. And, um, you yeah. know, from there, like, what do you do? Right. Like now your career is like, dude, like this is the best thing ever. Now we're, we're about to roll. And then it's switched immediately. I, um, a couple of years after that, I think a year and a half after that, after the, the hard year with the jets, very disappointing year. Um, people were like, what was it like to play for the jets? And I was like, well, 
I mean, I didn't really. I sort of stood there for the Jets. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was trying to just felt really compelled to to write about it to try to share and um it, it became something that i really felt like um god was pricking my heart for saying like oh you just thought i could just use you in the highs that like that god needed a, a platform god mm -hmm. doesn't need yeah. that god can do whatever he wants yeah and i was just su super convicted um that would I be willing to give the highs to him and give the lows to him? Mm. And um, when I, I started to write about it, I uh, called the uh, publishers and I said, I got it. It's late at night. And I said, I want to title it Shaken, Discover Your True Identities in the Midst of Life Storms. Mm -hmm. And they said, Oh, you mean unshaken, right? <laughs> because your you're, faith is, you're the because, optimistic guy. Because your faith is so strong that you're unshaken. And I know, no, I said, no, literally the opposite. <laughs> that in the midst of life storms, that when it feels like everything is shaken, mm. then who are you and whose are you? Yeah. And in those moments, what do you have to hold on to? And I'm so grateful that that God gave me the highest of the platform but i also can say later i'm grateful for the lows i couldn't have said it in it yeah yeah but afterwards i'm grateful for the lows because i feel like it gave me a different perspective and um a um pieces of a different heart too and a gratefulness even in that and through with that and and i also would say i think god did a lot of in my heart in those moments of disappointment mm -hmm. of really trying to seek him in a personal relationship and um one of the things that my i would always ring in my ears would be my mom saying hey timmy do you know you can give it to the lord the good but also the bad mm. and so many times how many times after a game would someone say, I just want to thank the, uh, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah. But you can say it after a loss to him. Yeah. You can say it after a disappointment. You can say it after a crushed dream. You can say it after a disappointment. You can have, you can say it after a heartbreak. Yeah. You can still say, thank you, Lord, because I know you're doing something. Yeah. I'll say one of the most powerful things I heard in sports in regards to that was, um, Monty Williams when his, um, wife died. He, it was like probably the most, uh, difficult thing I'd ever seen anyone do. And also like the most like inspiring where he was just like, you know, I'm just giving it all up to God. Like, you know, he's good and you know, it's rough for the family, but you know, I know that he's good and we're going to be all right. It's, it's because we get to know, but do we really trust what hope really means. You see, so many times in our society, we talk about hope as I hope we win or I'm flipping a coin. I hope it lands on heads, right? I'm wishing upon a star, but that's not the biblical form of hope. The biblical form of hope means that we get to look forward with confidence, expectation, and anticipation mm. because the biblical form of hope is not wishing upon a star. It's based on the promises of God. It's not luck. It's not luck. And, and we don't just serve a promise maker. We serve a promise keeper. And so we can hold on to the promise of God. We can hold on to the promises of God that even though this is hard, even though it's disappointing, even though it feels sucky, even though it's not what I wanted, God, I know somehow you're going to work all this together for good. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I know that somehow you were in this. I know that, that you're a God of reconciliation. I know that you're a God of healing. I know all of these things and I get to hold on to those promises, not always as much in the highs, but in the lows is where I, I need it. Yeah. And I'm just so grateful that that's who our God is. Yeah. And that we really get to understand that hope um, in the valley, even sometimes more than in the mountaintops. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, like, for me, I've gone through many valleys, um, you know, in my life, right? Like never had the amount of sports success you had, but in my own path, it was like, man, dude, I'm getting drafted. I'm, 
you know, fulfilling my dream. And then you get released for the yeah. first time. And you're like, huh. <laughs> I don't, that doesn't feel real good. Yeah. I don't know yeah. uh, what, what I'm supposed to do now. And you yes. know, when you're 24 years old and they're like, Hey, you're not good enough. You know, it's like, okay, nobody's ever told me that. Yeah. You know, and you get this reality. <laughs> they check. told me quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you, you get this reality check and you know, yeah. in baseball, it's, it's a little different than, well, you already know you play baseball. We'll get to that too. But like, you know, in baseball, it's a daily game yes. and the highs and lows are day to day, you know, like <laughs> bat to a bat. Yeah, yeah. It's way different than like, all right, I got a week. I got over it. Like, let's get on to the next one. Like now baseball's like, Hey, if you don't figure it out, like by tomorrow morning, all of a sudden you're over nine. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I just remember always riding the roller coaster in the season. Yeah. And I'm just like, why am I going through this? Why am I, you know, putting myself through so much crap, r- riding these buses and these motels and all this stuff and not making any money and not getting opportunities I felt like I deserved. And, you yeah. know, I like looking back at it, I always thought that my path was going to be, hey, like I'm going to, you know, get to the big leagues and I'm going to be a, a light to those on the team and in the media and, you know, all this stuff. And like you were like a prime example of what that looked like, right? Um, and then it didn't work out. Right. And then I have to go to the business world and, you know, the business world and, and social media and everything have treated me far better than baseball ever did. And like, um, you know, serving a completely different purpose that I had no desire to do. I didn't want to make content. I didn't want to like do real estate. All I wanted to do was play sports. Yeah. And, um, it's just like, I guess a testament to show like, you just never know what God's preparing you for. That's right. Like, I just know now in hindsight, like all those struggles just hardened me to like take on the rest of yeah. all this. I'm like, dude, you guys are complaining about this. Like, what are we talking about? You know, just with everything. Mm-hmm. I feel like now it's a bad way to say it, but like, I feel like most people are just so soft that I just don't even tolerate it anymore. I'm like, guys, no, that's not hard work. That's not what this, like, let's go. And through that, that, that journey and that disappointment, you can probably now look back and say, man, that was so much of God's preparation for now, what he has given you for now, where he has placed you Mm -hmm. for now, what he's, you know, he's calling you to do. Um, and for me, um, there has been, um, so many times where I would be able to, maybe not in the moment, see that, mm-hmm. but later could look back and see that. Yeah. And say, oh my goodness, what I thought was a setback, God, that was actually a setup. Mm-hmm. And I think so many times we see a setback, but I think we really have to look through that disappointment and try to keep taking the next step because we never know how it really is God's setting us up for maybe what he's calling us to most. Mm -hmm. Well, and I can tell you this, like, obviously, like, I'm very happy with where my life has has gone and everything else. And I'm grateful. Um, But like, even where I'm at today, there's always the next setback looming. Mm -hmm. Right. And like the last 12. Life is full of them. Yeah. Like the last 12 months. Um, business has been tough with the real estate market and interest rates and, you know, just all these different things happening. Right. I'm like, man, that was the hardest 12 months I've ever had in business because now it's a different type of problem. It wasn't like, oh, like, man, I'm struggling. It's like, no, you got like a hundred employees, you know, that you got to make sure and innovate for and figure out how to get through this and, you know, cover payroll and like all these people depend on, you Now, how do you get through that? Like it's a new level of responsibility. Yeah. And what I realized was at that time going through it, um, you don't really realize you're in a storm. You're just like, you're just battling. That's right. And you look back in hindsight and you're like, wow, that was quite the storm that God saw me through. But what I realized was he was really just pruning me for the next stage, yeah. removing things from my life and things that didn't serve his purpose and mm-hmm. everything to go to the next level. You know, it reminds me of uh, one of my favorite verses, John 16, 33. It's the night before Jesus goes to the cross and he's with his disciples and he tells them, like, hey guys, for in me, you have peace. In the world, 
it's guaranteed you will have trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. But take heart. I've I overcome have overcome the, the world. world. Yep. Right. It's just a, it's such a fascinating verse because it's before he went to the cross. Mm -hmm. But he says it with such certainty that I have overcome the world. Right. So when we face those trials and tribulations, one, we know where we find peace in him. And two, we know if we continue to look back at the cross, we're reminded he overcame the world so mm -hmm. we can keep marching forward. We can take to keep taking the next step because I know where I find peace and I know that we've won. Yeah. I know we found peace and I know we've won. Yeah. So I got to keep taking the next steps because this has been promised. I'm going to have trials. I'm going to have tribulations. Yeah. I'm going to have setbacks. Yeah. But the setbacks are not what defines me. His scars define me. Mm -hmm. I know in my circumstances is not where I find peace. I find peace in a person, in the Prince of Peace. Yep. And I get to remember that we've won, that he's won for us on our behalf. I just think that's such a great picture of in those moments, what we have to remember. It's too many times what I haven't remembered, mm -hmm. but it's such a good visual. I know where to find peace. I know that we've won. Keep going. Mm, I love that. You know, no. when you're talking about setbacks and, you know, obviously you can um, praise God in the downtimes too. I think a lot of people struggle with maybe this, uh, I don't want to say imposter syndrome, but we know that we're all jacked up people. No doubt. Right. And so it's very easy for the enemy to be like, Hey, no, you can't talk about God. Yes. Like you're, you're going to make him look bad. You're a hypocrite. You know, and especially if you're known, you you start to face it hip or um, criticism with yes. that, right? And I found myself doing that where it's like, have I always been successful? No, I've had business failures. I've had, you know, things that did not work out that caused problems and pain and all these things. And, um, you know, it, it really reminds me as I go through that now, because it's just a different stage of like higher stakes and being more known. It reminds me of like everything Paul talks about where he's like, yo. I was the worst guys, like literally I'm the worst and I owe it all to God. And I think so many people struggle to give God praise because they fear judgment because yes. their life isn't perfect. That's right. And, and I think that um, they're reminded of their sin. I'm reminded of my sin, but then we get to be reminded of the cross and then we can remember, wait a second. I'm not defined by my scars. I'm defined by his. I'm no longer called by my sin. I'm called by my name. Mm -hmm. When I know Jesus, what is my name? As son of God, child of the king, the king of the world who will forever reign. That's who my dad is. And I, I, you know, it's not because of, of my work. Like Christianity yeah. is not because, oh my goodness, like Ryan, you did a really good job. Timmy, you did a good job. No, it's not average to a little bit better. It is dead to alive because of what he did on our behalf for us. Grace is unmerited favor. Yeah. Like we didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Yeah. I never have. But he loves us enough anyways. Mm -hmm. That is the free gift of God. Mm -hmm. God loves us enough. Wow, it's just, it's so staggering and overwhelming that the God of this universe would love me enough, would love you enough, because that's who he is. Mm -hmm. That even when we are enemies of him, he mm -hmm. still loves us. Yep. That he would still be the ransom for us on the cross that he would be the propitiation, the payment that satisfies mm -hmm. for us, that on this rescue mission, he would die for us. And in our society, how do we know how much something is worth? By what someone is willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That means that your life has infinite value and worth. How do I know that? because a son of God who has infinite value and worth was willing to take your place. That changes everything. That, that also changes not just the confidence that we should live for, not because of what we've done, but what he's done for us, but also changes the way that I should treat you and treat every other person. Because now when I see you, 
I should be reminded of what Jesus did for you Mm -hmm. and every other person. Now I don't treat them for what we have in common in a earthly way. I treat them for what we have in common in Jesus dying on the cross for us. Mm -hmm. That changes everything. Yeah. No, hundred percent. You know, I heard you um, once say, I don't even like while we were talking, I didn't even plan to bring this up, but I, I remember the clip you were on stage one time and you said something along the lines of, Hey, you know, I don't like it when people say, you know, you can pretty much like do anything like God, like, I don't remember the full context of it, but like what you were saying was like, no, like God gave you your gifts and your uniqueness. And sometimes that ain't to play in the NFL. Sometimes that's not to be the boss. Like (laughs) everyone has their place in the kingdom and you need to be the very best at whatever, you know, gifts he's given you and the place he's put you, but not everyone's meant to go be this extraordinary, like known person. Well, well, I don't know which clip yeah. that's referring to, but I, I know sometimes we'll tell kids that, Hey, you can go be anything you want. That's exactly and what you're that's, saying. That's, yeah. that's just not accurate. Like, <laughs> yeah. They will tell kids, Hey, listen, you know, y- you can go one day be LeBron James in basketball. No, um, no, you can't. Sir, your, your son can't <laughs> dribble, you know? Like, wh- why would you say that? Now, it's not about trying to not give someone confidence. Mm-hmm. That's that's not it at all. It's just that we, sometimes we have certain gifts and sometimes we don't have certain gifts. Yeah. But why would you encourage someone that has no athletic ability <laughs> that one day you could go be better than Tom Brady? Instead of saying you can be the best at whatever you want, why would we not just encourage them that you can be your best? Mm-hmm. Not all of us can be the best, but all of us can be our best. Mm-hmm. We can strive for it. And we have no idea what God can do in us and through us. Yep. We have no idea what God can do. So you always want to um, believe that God can show up and do whatever in us and through us. But also, we don't want to say that, oh, I can just go do anything I want because I can do all things through Christ's strength and strength. <laughs> That's not the context. Yeah. The context is wherever God puts me, whatever has been put on my lap. It's not I can go do anything. It's that whatever he's placed me, God can give me the strength to handle it. Yeah. To get through it. Yeah. And and I think sometimes we think oh, I can do anything. Yeah. And and if that's what God calls you to, God can also equip you, but it's that where God places you, yeah, that he can give you strength to handle it. Yeah. Well, it's funny because even with that verse, you know, Philippians 4:13 uh being misquoted, it's like the the verse right before that, the context is Paul's in prison you know, and he's like, look, I've, I've learned to become content no matter what's happening in my life. You know, I could be in prison. I could be, it doesn't matter. I'm good. And that's where, um, also so much of perspective should be realized. You see, Paul is, is writing from what a lot of scholars believe is in the basement of prison, which could be full of mud and sewage filth. And some believe it was even probably up to his waist where he's writing some of this and, and just nasty. Yeah. But he, he's telling us rejoice in all things. Again, I say rejoice. I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. Like you look at all of these verses, like, and you're like, oh my goodness. And, and this is at a time when he could be killed at any moment. Mm-hmm. Yet he's saying this, my circumstances is not why I rejoice in my relationship with him's why I can rejoice. Mm-hmm. My situation, my circumstances isn't where I find joy. It's in the promises of God. It's in the, the hope of Jesus Christ is where I find my joy for the joy of the Lord is my strength. Mm-hmm. Not in my circumstances, not in, not in my situations. And I know that's something that, that I miss the mark I, that man in certain situations, I've rejoiced on my situation and not in my relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. The outcome. Because my situation, it can go up and down. But you know why a relationship with with Christ can be so incredible in, in in the personal relationship is because even when that circumstances change, I can still rejoice. Mm -hmm. Even when we go into that valley, I can still rejoice Mm -hmm. because 
I know that his promises are still true. I know that his love for me is still true. I know what my ID says is still true. Mm-hmm. That's still my identity. Yep. Child of God, son of the king, home in heaven. And so many times, if we listen to what the world wants to say about us and define us, we're going to live a roller coaster. But we don't have to. Not if we focus on the promises of God Mm -hmm. and what he has called us to. And yes, our emotions will still go up and down, but even in those times, Mm -hmm. we still get to rejoice. Yeah. I, uh, I tell people all the time, I'm like, guys, look, you know, if you're focusing your identity on your career, your business, like it's just always going to be like this. It's a guaranteed roller coaster. Oh, for sure. And then I see people who are like, oh, I'm not into that. But now they're putting their identity in even their family. They're like, my, you know, their wife, their spouse, their kids success. And I'm like, you yeah, know, that's, that's also going to be like that, Yeah, you know? And it's like, there's only one firm foundation. That's, that's right. it. Like nothing. But it's this, also yeah. doing it in the practical, you know, there, for a long time, I could have said the right thing, mm-hmm. right? Hey, where's your, if, so, if you would have said, you know, Timmy, where's your identity? Oh, my identity's in Christ. <laughs> but how many times in the practical, you know, I, I would, I would know that my identity is in Christ, but in the practical, I would, st- I would still sometimes put it in a game. Yeah, and I would, I would still sometimes put it in a win or yeah. a loss. Mm-hmm. I would still sometimes put it in uh, the praise or the criticism, and it's actually trying to take all that in the practical and put it in. Okay, regardless of what they say, regardless of the wins or the losses, the highs or the lows. God, I want my identity to be in you. Yeah. Let me ask you a question like some I've struggled with. You know, when I look back at my sports career, you know, I think about like, man, dude, you know, that was like the time that I was putting, you know, saying the right things, but like looking back, I'm like, nah, that wasn't really what was happening, right? Putting your identity in wins and stats and all this. And then when you're frustrated, you, you know, I look back, I'm like, man, dude, I never cussed more than my life when I was playing sports, you know, just like so mad after one at bat. And I look back and I'm like, wow, like what a terrible represent, like just one bat at bat. And I'm like, all of a sudden I just shift. Right. And then, you know, I look back at just like the anxieties or you know, problems with loneliness, being on the road and temptations with porn and all these other things. And I'm like, man, like baseball was not like great for me, like in hindsight with all these different things. And then I really look at it now and I'm like, man, I'm able to help a lot more people with what I do today, Yeah, you know, with, you know, teaching people how to, you know, live godly lives and make money and do these things that are going to help their families and all that. And I look back to what I was doing in baseball and I, I kind of feel guilty because to me, it was more of like a selfish endeavor of like, I'm just kind of playing a game for fun. Like I, I enjoy playing the game and it's great, but it's not like it was like changing lives or anything. And I think that sometimes happens too, as I try new things too. It's like, all right, cool. Like, you know, we're flipping houses and like I was providing for my family and like we, we give employees jobs and stuff. But then I'm like, man, flipping a house is like, it's just flipping a house. It just kind of is what it is. And then like, I find myself desiring to do things that are just way more purposeful. Um, you know, whether it be, you know, like, you, like what you're doing with the nonprofit or talking about God in interviews like this, even though it's a business podcast, things that like this won't get as many views as something else we could, but it's way more purposeful. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, man, like it's just something I found myself thinking about a lot of like, what are the things that are actually going to last, have meaning, Mm -hmm. have real purpose. But I I would encourage you in this way, Ryan, that I, I still think that there's some things that we could do that we might not feel the purpose in them, but God could use the ripple effects, the platform, the Mm -hmm. moments in there to do so many things from it. Um, And sometimes it might only be a certain act, but maybe 
it could transcend that to something more, Mm -hmm. right? So maybe you just see it as a flipping house, but when you do that in a kind, loving, caring way, when you care about the people that you're interacting with and doing business way and they see you do it, you have no idea the ripple effects of, of how that, that works for all the people that see it and and think, oh my gosh, I could do it in a certain way. Right. Right. I, the the way that I got to see Danny Werfel, who was a quarterback for Florida in the 90s that won a national championship at Heisman Trophy. I got to watch him and say, oh my goodness, like that's the model. He was good, but yeah. then he also honored the Lord afterwards and he was humble and he praised his teammates. And I remember when I was a boy and he came to our church and I was probably the 108th kid in line and he waited to sign my autograph and how it made me feel. And those weren't necessarily purposeful acts of just playing a game yeah but it transcended to more for me where i thought maybe if i got that chance one day maybe i could make a kid feel like he made me feel yeah maybe i could encourage someone maybe i could inspire someone you have no idea the ripple effects that god can do with the small little choices of love caring kindness compassion Mm. that we make like sometimes yes we do want to have grand gestures of generosity and giving and loving and awesome. But sometimes it might just need to be the small faithful steps of doing something well, because we also believe that whatever our hand finds to do, do with all of our might that we're, we need to also do our best because it's a way that we can honor the Lord. It's a way that we can give it to him. It's a way that what, with the time, talent, treasure that he's given us, even when it's not speaking on a stage, but it's the kindness you show backstage, right? That every one of those that all matters. Uh, moments, they all matter. Yeah. And I, I think from the, the learning moments that you were sharing on the bus or the, the little moments of a flipping a house, every one of that God can use in your life and through your life. And, and, and I'm sure he's using so many of them still to this day. Like our God is a big God that can use all of that in so many different ways. And I just don't want to ever want to underestimate him and what he could do with all of it. Mm. The good and the bad, the highs and the lows, the things that we felt like that was nothing. Or man, we feel like this is everything. Yeah. No, I love it. No, that, that definitely brings me encouragement to, to, I guess, uh, and I don't want to say like I was feeling guilty about doing things like that. It's like, you know, today, you know, we went out and played golf That's amazing. Right. And I'm not, I'm never going to feel bad about playing golf, but <laughs> I, I will say if I were to become one of these guys where it's like, yeah, you know, I just retire and play golf every day. I'd be like, I think that's kind of being disobedient to what God's, you know, I could be doing for the kingdom. Right. Um, but even like thinking about that, right. You, um, you know, you, you, you went out of football and you did the TV stuff and books and speaking and everything. And then you decided to go to baseball. Why? Because I loved it and never left my heart. I prayed about it a lot. I saw a bunch of pastors council. They encouraged me. I saw, um, and I, um, it definitely wasn't for the money either, <laughs> uh, um, or the travel, the trips. Yeah. It was because it was something that was on my heart. And, um, and there was a lot of opportunities then to go do a lot of other things where the money and the platform and everything was a lot different yeah. um or, that's what i'm saying like how, like what made you choose <laughs> like a not glorious path you know to like because pursue? i because i felt if i didn't do it i would regret it mm. and i didn't want the the money or the praise or criticism to define what i was gonna go do yeah um i wanted to to try to go pursue what i believe was on my heart yeah and um man even in the sometimes the boring bus rides or sometimes the far places. Man, I'll tell you, there were so many of those moments. I still loved yeah. playing that game. Oh yeah. Even sometimes it's a silly game, but man, it was so fun. Oh yeah. And there were moments too, not every moment, but a lot of moments that the joy that you had as a little boy playing that game also came back. Yep. And it was really fun. Yeah. I uh after I got released by the A's, I played five seasons of independent baseball. Okay. Not definitely not for money. Yeah. Like, and I just loved it. And I just knew there was a, you know, a lifespan on sports. And I'm like, hey, yeah, I'm just gonna play as long as they let me. Um, but what made you finally, I guess, decide to hang them up? It was when I got the opportunity to uh, go play for the Jaguars and I had to make another hard decision. Mm. Go back to the Mets or 
um, go take this opportunity. And I took that opportunity and it didn't work out the way that I hoped or wanted it to. And I remember going home afterwards. I think it was my birthday or the day after my birthday after getting cut. Yeah. And I was so hurt, disappointed. Did you feel like you made the wrong choice? Um, some of it, yes. And some of it, I could sort of say, well, I know I'm supposed to give my disappointments to the Lord, but, but God, it's also embarrassing. And my pride was hurt. Mm -hmm. And I was so disappointed. My wife was being so encouraging, just so encouraging. Yeah. But I was kind of sulking in it. Well, right then, it's where all of this stuff started to happen in Afghanistan, where um, so much chaos started taking place. And we had a, a lot of people that were serving in many areas um, around the Middle East. And so not long after that, I had a chance to fly to one of the countries in the Middle East. And when we got there, um, I got to, to go and an evacuate we a refugee camp and, and we're serving and helping and people are fighting for their lives. I mean, because they've been trampled, because they're hurting, because so many reasons. And, and we, we finished serving there and we get to then go fly to another country to serve at another um, evacuee and refugee place. And I was so convicted and on that second flight, it was the first time in a little while that I could say to God and mean it, God, thank you. Mm. Thank you for letting me get cut because God, if you wouldn't have set me up to play for the Jacks and then what I felt like was a setback, a disappointment. And I thought is a hurt to my pride because I just thought, oh man, all this being played on every sports center is just your worst plays all the time, <laughs> you know? And, yeah. and it was just, and I thought, was thinking sitting there, is this really going to be my last professional sporting event and game and moment, like out of everything? Really? Yeah. And then, but then all that started happening. So I, I get to go and I'm there. And when I got back on the plane, I just started to think and we're flying and I just start becoming emotional and convicted. Yeah. That it wasn't a setback mm -hmm. to my pride. It was yeah. to my ego. It was, and maybe to how I could have perceived it, it was, but it was actually God saying, no, no, no. It was one of your greatest setups. Because I don't, I didn't just create you so that you could play sports or a game. I have you serving here and then where you're about to land serving there because that's one of the greatest callings for your life is to serve the most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. Not to just chase a different MVP, a most valuable player, but to serve the most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. That will be your greatest MVP that you ever run after. Is It's not some championship or award or touchdown but it's to hurting people. Which one are you gonna value more? Mm. And I was and I was also reminded that, man, if I wouldn't have been playing for the Jaguars, I would have had an event. I would have been speaking or events or a book or something. We would have been doing something. My schedule would have been packed. Yep. I would not have had the freedom to have just been cut to then get on a plane to go to the Middle East. Would never have had that freedom. Mm -hmm. I would have had to wait till a free day and then be able to do it. But God set it up in a way that I would have the, the time, the freedom to then fly, to be reminded what I'm called to do. Mm. And all this time of thinking, man, it's just a setback, but it was really, it wasn't, yeah. it was, it was God setting me up. And so much time you're thinking, God, where are you in this? Where are you in this? I thought this was going to be different. You know, because when I did that, I saw so many pastors and advice and wise counsel, and they all thought, no, this is the place to go, go do this. You need to go do this with the Jags. You know, God opening the door, but the door was actually opened for me to be able to be reminded what I'm supposed to do even more. Mm, I love that. I can say this for anybody who's like, um, you know, they're playing your, your low lights, like to go into baseball after not playing all these years and then like 12 get, yeah and then to, to get to triple a and like to do what you did people don't know like how crazy that is um i know but like i'm like dude it's crazy like for anybody who's hating they don't they don't get it um 
but yeah, I, I, I agree. Like just, it, it, it's always one door is closing to, to open up the next door and whatever that next stage is. But do you really believe it in the moment? So many times yeah, I could have hard. said that too, but yeah. do you really believe it? All right, God, you shut this door. Yeah. But I trust you. Mm-hmm. I trust you in this moment that the plans that you have for me, it's, it's really what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And so many times it's my plans for, for me or what I'm supposed to do. Mm-hmm. But God, your plans for me. Because do we really trust that they're better? That there's more purpose, more fulfillment, mm-hmm. more meaning, more significance in his plans than ours. Yeah, That's where one of the strongest conflicts is going to come in our lives. My plans your plans. Now, my plans don't mean they're bad plans. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean they're for bad things. Yeah. But God, will I trust you and your sovereign plan and the workmanship that you have in the plans that you have wrote before I was ever born for my life more than my plans? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of times we want to, uh, <laughs> we say we're like, yeah, God, you know, like, I just want to follow your will. Let your will be done. It's like, as long as it aligns with my will, <laughs> then we're good. Then we'll, we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> as long as they're in alignment, you know, we're good. Yeah. But like, even speaking of that, right. I think, um, you know, you're married now. Yeah. How long have you married now? Three and a half years. So like you're recently married. You yeah. got married later. Like what, That's right. what was it like, I guess, being who you are. Right. And then trying to find uh, a spouse. I you tell know, all these you, years. it was, um, just such a gift from God. Yeah. Um, not because we really had everything in common. My wife's from South Africa. My wife was involved in pageants. <laughs> I am not from South Africa. Yeah. I was not involved in pageants. Her favorite songs were not my favorite songs. Her first language is not mine. So many differences. But man, what a special gift it was that what it wasn't what we had in common. It was what we had in purpose. Mm-hmm that so many of the things that pricked her heart that God had done in her life um, to prune her and open her eyes to certain things that her, some of her greatest callings were for those that were being trafficked and abused and then also special needs. Some of the biggest ways that God had pricked my heart. And it was like, man, our first conversation was two hours, 24 minutes and six seconds. (laughs) And nothing, nothing was about a game yeah or a pageant or um like where we wanted to live or what our favorite movie or song was Mm -hmm. it was about things that were so much more important Mm -hmm. and uh, it's just such such a special gift yeah how do you think that's changed um you i think it's helped me grow in so many ways i think it helps remind us so many ways of how selfish we actually really are yeah um and so many ways from from honestly usually more little things Mm -hmm. because the big things you're like oh no i'm willing to more compromise on that but the little things you realize wow i'm actually more selfish than the little things yeah like you know dirty dishes or throwing away cans or whatever or be like it's only the second quarter why do i need to throw these cans (laughs) away right now you know wait till the end of the game i'll throw it away yeah but then one of the things that i've been convicted by is why on something so silly that could give her such joy. joy why would i actually argue that mm-hmm. and one of the things that, that my pastor says that's really impacted me is do you know what happens when you win timmy she loses she loses yeah that's right mm-hmm. or anything when i win someone else loses when they win I, But this isn't about winning and losing. We can take that competitiveness and pull it to the side. It's not about winning and losing. It's about fellowship, relationship, community. It's about something so much different. So sometimes that competitor mindset is different. I'm not trying to win an argument. I'm trying to um, bring joy to someone that I love so dearly. Yeah. It's a different mindset. Yeah. It's, I just uh, celebrated 10 years. Congratulations, man. Yeah. We got married young and, you know, we've got three kids now and, uh, It's funny, like you say that because for me, you know, on the marriage side and then, because you guys don't have kids yet, right? Not yet. Yeah. Kids is like brings this whole new element to the fold. And uh, it's the same thing. I've learned how selfish 
like I was. And then even with kids, I was like, man, I thought like having a wife made me like way less selfish. <laughs> and then you have kids and you're like, man, I got to give up everything to like take care of these knuckleheads and like, you know, be there for them and give them time and attention and, you know, love them and everything. And, you know, it's just, it just keeps bringing these new levels of like, man, I got to serve. And yeah, that, if you're three years in, I'll say like, yeah, don't, don't try to win the argument. There's, there's, <laughs> you, you lose, you lose. That's who loses. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy, man. So what's your guys' uh, you know, focus these days, right? I mean, it seems like you've got, you know, you're, you're doing the, the sport or the analyst stuff and mm -hmm. you're speaking and you're actually going to be speaking um, at WealthCon. Yes, I, I totally forgot to even to talk about that. I know, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So, guys, Tim's going to be speaking wait. in Vegas yes. January 8th to the 11th. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited because I'll tell you this. Um, each event, you know, I always try and get somebody that I really want to get to know and meet and like who I think is going to bring an amazing message. And um, there was two guys. I was like, all right, I want either Tebow or Deion Sanders. I want one of those two guys. And if whoever I get this time, I want the other one, you know, the next time. And uh, I was just super hyped that, uh, you know, you were available, can make it happen. And, super grateful. Yeah. yeah. I think we're literally coming from the national championship game um, to Vegas for the event. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the thing, the championship is maybe the night before or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to so, be fun, dude. So, I mean, you're obviously speaking and doing all these things like, what I guess fuels you at this point? Like what's your big, I know you got some kind of goal you're working towards. Yeah, There's no I, way I, somebody I, who's I, competitive I, isn't, you I know. I think it's um, one of the areas that I think um, God made us with certain um, gifts and drives for a reason. And he's made me very competitive. And one of the areas that I believe he's tried to steer that is for hurting people. It's, it's what we're doing here. And you ask, what are me and my wife have as goals? Well, we love getting to care for people together. Um, you know, she just has such a heart for those that have been um, been trafficked, those that have been in hard situations, um, for um, those have, that have um, felt like no one has ever loved them or have their back. And you know what? God's perked my heart in so many different ways for, um, for hurting people. And now we get to serve and, um, in 88 countries around the world. And you said, what is our goal to get them more? Yeah. One more country, one more boy, one so, more girl. So the goal's like the foundation at this point. Like it's that's the, the, it's big the goal. biggest goal. Yeah. It's more than anything else. I mean, I love getting to share and speak and do so many different, I love it. I love it so much and write. Um, but if you said there's one biggest, it would be to bring faith, hope, and love to those needing a brighter day in their darkest hour of need to fight for people that can't fight for themselves. That's the mission statement. Yes, it is. And and where do people find out more about that? They can go to timtofoundation.org and um, and check it out. And um, it's the greatest honor of our lives. Yeah. How So how many years have you guys been running that now? Uh, since 2010. Oh, wow. 13 years. 13 years. Yeah. What, like, what are, I know you got some stats and KPIs. What, what, what are some cool things you guys have done? Um, well, we're fortunate to have, um, uh, uh, 40 safe homes either up or in progress. Mm. Um, we have, um, several hospitals with our partners, um, a bunch of different orphanages, um, rescuing as many as we can out of human trafficking, um, a bunch of safe homes here um, domestically as well as internationally um, to have Night to Shine, a worldwide prom for people with special needs mm -hmm. um, uh, in all 50 states and a bunch of countries around the world. Yep. Um, just trying to love and care for as many um of the most vulnerable around the world is, is possible. So to maybe make it easier to explain, it would be who we fight for. Yeah. And that would be the thrown away, the abused, the beaten, uh, those with special needs, those with profound medical needs, um, whoever has been, um, viewed as less than because we know that they're not to God. Yeah. You know, my son, um, my firstborn, he's about to be five years old and, um, he was born premature two months. So he spent two months in the NICU. And then he had to have brain surgery. Mm -hmm. And so like, this was all within his first year of life, very difficult. And, mm -hmm. you know, they told us he probably had special needs and everything. And, um, you know, he's had a ton of developmental delays and we were actually in UCLA last week seeing a neurologist who's a specialist in all of this. And, you know, we're, we're now going down the path of like genetic testing and, you know, these MRIs to kind of see what's going on. But, um, you know, it's probably some form of autism. 
Um, but I totally forgot that you did this with your night to shine because um, the church I've attended for 10 years in Vegas, the crossing mm -hmm. has held it for many years. A lot of years. Many, many years. Yeah, maybe all are close to it. Yeah. I've been there for a while too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I've seen um, what you guys are doing. Explain they that. Do, they do an amazing job. Well, Night to Shine is a worldwide prom for people with special needs. And uh, this year will be our 10th year anniversary of Night to Shine. It's truly my and my wife's favorite night of the year. It's actually what brought us together. My, my wife had um, a sister with special needs mm -hmm. and unfortunately she's passed away now. Um, but that was, she was our matchmaker. So she says her sister and I say night to shine. Yeah. And um, it's um, why it matters so much is because it is um, around 16% of the world's population and many of them have never been celebrated, have yep. never been cheered for and have never been um, praised. You know, m me and you know what it's like to be applauded and to be praised. And many of them have never, so many around the world have been viewed as less than, have been tied up, chained up, never allowed out of their house. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I got a, um, a text from one of our team last night um, from one of the church members in a certain country that got a, um, a letter from one of the parents of Night to Shine that said um, that, hey, up until um, uh, uh, Night to Shine, I just viewed my daughter as cursed. Mm. but now I view her as a blessing. Yeah. And man, if we can change the narrative, if we can celebrate, you know, um, out of Jesus's publicly recorded miracles, over 60% of them were for the afflicted and over 70% of them were for the most vulnerable. And, you know, in, in our society, afflicted would mean a sort of a special needs, Yeah. right? And so if Jesus has a heart for those with special needs, those with different abilities, then we need to have a heart for them. And those that have been looked beyond, looked past, looked above, mm -hmm. We can't do it any longer. We yeah. have to see them, love them, care for them, run to them, celebrate them as the the image bearers of our creator um, as they are. And we need to love them. And we need to, that love is not just one where we say it, but it's the love where we need to demonstrate it as the agape form of love that God has for us and we're called to have for one another. I love it. No, and, and for you to, like it took me having a special needs son to like really understand the full scope of it. And you know, now just with everything we do, I'm like, man, like, I'm so glad God put him into our lives to give us perspective yes. and to understand, like, we have resources, you know, and to see these other families who don't, and they have, you know, to deal with so much yes. and so many appointments and so many doctor bills and all this, you know, these different things. I'm like, man, I don't know how they do it because it's hard for us. Yes. And, um, I just love what you guys are doing. Cause I've seen, you know, night to shine in my own church for many, many years, dude. So just want to say, uh, it's a blessing for just everything you're doing, man, and using your platform and, um, the stewardship of, you know, all your talents and just exposure and attention and all the things you you're doing. It's amazing, man. So just want to thank you, dude. And, and you know, Appreciate you just taking the time for this interview. So and, grateful. Thank yeah, you. Coming to WealthCon, dude. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait. It's going to be fun. Thanks yeah. for spending the time. Yeah, dude. So guys, if you enjoyed this interview, definitely uh, make sure you're subscribed. Go check out the Tebow Foundation and we'll see you on the next one. Peace. I don't love all the work. I love meeting the next version of me. I love more self-discovery. I love expanding my being. I'm addicted to the expansion of me. You know, we're both baseball guys. And I remember making literally 1200 bucks a month 